All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, this is a beginner's guide to creating a native garden, take two. Um, I am Stacey Matrazo, the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation, and this is my um, partner, uh, Craig Mazur. Um, in case you don't know about our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Um, you can learn more about what we do at our website, flawildflowers.org. Um, we are funded primarily through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. If you have this plate or our old license plate, you are supporting our work and we thank you very much. Um, those funds along with donations and memberships help us provide programs like what you're seeing tonight, as well as all the resources you'll find on our website, our grant programs, uh, research programs, and, and so much more. So um, please check us out and um, support us if you like what you see. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, creating a native garden and, and to share our personal story about what we did to transform our landscape. Um, but what I'm really talking about is creating habitat. So, um, you know, what makes a landscape habitat and why does that matter? We in Florida, Florida is one of the most biodiverse states in the country. Um, we have about 2,800 native plant species, including more ancient species than any other state. Uh, but we're also one of the fastest growing states. And so as we develop to accommodate this growth, we are putting more pressure on our natural lands. We are decreasing them and, and creating these tiny little islands of habitat. And, and it's not enough to sustain our um, native wildlife. Um, I use this quote, I use a few quotes from Doug Tallamy. And if you're not familiar with him, um, definitely check out his books. He's done a lot of research to give us some background on why it's so important to plant native plants in our landscapes. Um, but what he talks about here is how, you know, again, as we're developing and we're, we're creating these tiny isolated islands of habitat and they're just not big enough and, and full of enough resources to support our native wildlife. And so it's important that we look at our own landscapes and figure, you know, look at ways that we can actually um, balance that out. And what he says is we need to, to raise the bar for what our landscapes do for us. Um, and, and, you know, with our, with our urban landscapes, we are our urban areas, it's all built up and it's, it's, you know, what we can do to put back into that or, or mitigate all of this um, development by adding them into our own home landscapes and help bridge that divide between those fragmented areas. Um, and we can do that, just advance, sorry about that. We can do that um, easily by reducing the amount of turf grass that we have in our landscapes and the amount of non-native plants, um, especially turf grass. We mow it, we herbicide it, we fertilize it, and it serves no ecological value. It's basically a, a dead zone, at least the St. Augustine grass that we're all um, used to seeing. It takes a lot of our time and energy um, it doesn't give anything back to us or to the wildlife that we're trying to provide for. So, um, you know, if we can eliminate it from our landscape, great. If we can reduce it, maybe you're in an HOA and you're required to keep a certain amount, you can still reduce how much you have and replace it with native plants. So, and we can also look at our natives um, for their ornamental value. A lot of the plants that are commonly used in our landscapes are um, we put them there because they look good and they're attractive, but they're not native, but um, we can start looking at our natives that have ornamental appeal, but also have that ecological value that our wildlife are relying on. And you might not realize it, but a lot of the common landscape plants are actually categorized as invasive species. And this means that in the natural world, um, these plants have displaced or are hybridized with our native species. Um, they've altered the natural ecological community or ecological function, and they're just wreaking havoc in our natural areas. So it's really important that we um, not use these in our landscapes. And that requires being aware of what species are invasive. Um, you'll see here in Lantana, the creeping oxide, fountain grass, Mexican petunia, these are all really commonly used plants in um, residential developments. Um, 
they're available at your big box stores and there's nothing on them indicating that they are invasive. So you really need to, to you know, do some research and know ahead of time what it is you're buying. Um, there aren't any laws either that prohibit the sale or use of these plants. So, um, you know, again, even though they look nice and they're promoted as easy to grow, if you use them in your landscape, you're not necessarily providing the resources that native plants can provide. Uh, and more importantly, you may be contributing to an ecological problem or, you know, worst case scenario. Um, at the least you're promoting these to other people. So other people are gonna see them in your landscape and think that it's okay to use them as well. So um, this is another presentation unto itself. And uh, I am giving a talk, uh, our monthly webinar for the foundation on, on March 2nd on invasive alternatives. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, please visit our website, flawildflowers.org and uh, you can sign up for that free webinar as well. But plants need to do more than just look pretty. They really should play a role in our landscapes ecosystem. And yeah, your landscape can and should become an ecosystem, a habitat. Um, let's invite wildlife into our landscapes, the wildlife that we've displaced by creating these built environments. And again, we can do this easily by planting natives, um, removing invasives, and reducing or eliminating the non-natives and turf grass. And when we do this, we are also encouraging others to do it. Um, you know, when, when your neighbors walk by and see this beautiful landscape alive with activity from birds and butterflies and, and other wildlife, they're gonna wanna do it too. And if I have a native landscape and my neighbors have a native landscape and their neighbors do and so on, then we're starting to build these connected corridors of habitat that will provide pathways for our wildlife to get between those disparate natural areas and, and find the resources they need in our built environment. Um, Florida native plants in particular are very adapted to the unique conditions here in the state. Um, Florida has a lot of harsh conditions sometimes. We're, we're coastal, so we're subject to winds and salt, um, hurricanes, drought, um, things that make plants, uh, things that make it difficult for a lot of, of plants that aren't from here to grow. But our native plants are um, adapted to these conditions, so they're suited to survive in um, these harsh uh, climate conditions. Um, they've also are better suited to um, provide resources for our native wildlife. They they evolved with our native wildlife and pollinators, so they do have what those animals need. Uh, to, to survive. They also curb water use, uh, reduce the need for chemicals like fertilizers and herbicides, um, and they can help enrich the soil. A lot of our natives can actually put nutrients back in the soil, which is it's good and important. And certainly they beautify our landscapes and are part of a diverse environment. When you are thinking about um, converting your landscape and creating habitat, you wanna think about diversity. And I mean diversity of all kinds. When you're building your plant palette, um, you wanna include plants of different habits. So um, wildflowers, vines, uh, grasses, shrubs, and trees, they all provide different types of um, resources and habitat for our, our native wildlife. Wildflowers um, are beautiful. They, they add a pleasing aesthetic to the landscape, but they also provide nectar and pollen. Um, a lot of insects or some insects will actually nest in the hollow stems of, of wildflowers. Uh, they provide seeds for birds. They also attract insect eating birds because they're attracting the insects that those birds uh, want to eat as well. Vines are good. Um, in a small space, if you can't plant out, you can plant up. Um, they do add vertical interest to a landscape and they'll also provide food and cover opportunities for wildlife as well. Um, grasses are great for literally supporting wildflowers. Um, in nature, they will work together to keep our wildflowers upright, um, but they also add texture and movement to a landscape. And, and just can give it a really nice um, aesthetic as well. Grasses are good for creating borders 
um, both low and high, depending on which species you pick. Um, and they too offer seeds um, and nesting material and cover opportunities for, for wildlife as well. And then of course, trees and shrubs are important. They're centerpieces to um, our landscapes. They are, many of them are micro habitats in themselves, but they also provide, again, food, um, fruit and, and cover and, and things that our wildlife rely on. So that's diversity of habit, of plant type. You also want to plant a diversity of seasonal offerings. So look for plants when you're, when you're creating your palette, look for plants that bloom in spring, summer, and fall so that you've always got a nectar and a pollen source in your landscape. Um, look too for plants that produce fruit throughout the year. Um, you know, again, so you have food in your landscape. Um, and look for host plants. It's great to provide nectar for our butterflies and moths, but many of them um, rely on specific plants to lay their eggs on. Those eggs that hatch and create the caterpillars, they need specific plants. So include host plants in your landscape as well to have a good complete habitat. Um, and include evergreen dense foliage plants that will provide nesting and cover opportunities throughout the year. If you can include um, other resources like a birdhouse or a bee condo, um, you know, something else to attract and provide habitat for wildlife, um, that's a good option too. Do you want to deal with that? Sorry, <laughs> we have a little noisemaker under the um, desk here. Um, we we um, put some uh, brush pile is really good. We just started throwing twigs up against our oak tree and it's kind of created a little bit of a, um, a little micro habitat. We've seen lizards and um, uh, we've had a black racer kind of hanging out in there. So it provides another opportunity for, um, for wildlife as well. So all of these things, it sounds like a lot, it's really not, but these are all the different things that you want to consider so that you're not just planting a native plant, but you're actually planting it with intention and, and you know, looking to offer or to provide um, a variety of resources that our wildlife rely on. Um, you also want to make sure that you're selecting the right plant for the right place, the right plant for the conditions that your landscape offers. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, is your landscape, does it get it mostly sun? Is it mostly shade? Different plants are going to do well um, in those different conditions. So you want to make sure you know how much sun your, your yard is getting throughout the day to help you choose the right plant. Um, same with your soil moisture. If you've got very dry, sandy, well-drained soils, you probably don't want to choose a wetland plant because it's not going to get what it needs from your landscape. Um, also think about what part of the state you live in. Um, we are here in nine, zone 9B here in Central Florida, which gives us a lot of versatility because we we're kind of at the southern range of our northern Florida plants. We're at the northern range of our southern Florida plants. And then we have a whole host of plants that are suitable for this part of the state too. Um, but just because it's a Florida native doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work anywhere in Florida. We have a lot of plants that grow only in the northern panhandle. So if you try to plant that down in Miami-Dade, it's probably not going to work. So make sure that you're choosing plants that are acclimated to the part of the state that you live in. Um, also know where your plants come from. Um, you know, when you're buying your plants, you wanna buy from trusted sources. You wanna buy from people who can speak to the, the origins of the plant and the conditions under which the plants were grown. Um, for example, a lot of the plants that are, that are available at our big box stores, um, they're sourced from a handful of large growing facilities in different parts of the country, in Colorado, for example. And so those plants are, are you know, they were raised in a different altitude, different climate, different soil conditions. And so all of them, you know, they're shipped here, they're sold to you, and then you put them in your Florida landscape and they don't do so well. Even if it's a species that's native to Florida, if it was um, grown from stock or grown in another part of the country, it, it's not acclimated to, you know, our conditions here. So, um, and you want to know what's been done to it. 
Um, many of the plants that you find at the big box stores have been treated with chemicals. They want to make them look as beautiful and as, you know, as interesting on the shelf so that you'll buy it and take it home. But sometimes that requires uh, chemical treatments or um, fertilizers and, and um, insecticides. So you're buying something with the intention of providing food for wildlife, and then you're putting it in your landscape and, and sometimes you know, to the detriment of the wildlife that you're trying to attract. So um, be aware of that. The best thing you can do is um, you know, buy your plants from a nursery that specializes in native plants. And you can find a list of nurseries that do that on uh, plantrealflorida.org, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries website. Um, you can also, if you're looking for seeds, buy them from the Florida Wildflower Cooperative. Um, and definitely check with your Native Plant Society chapter because um, I know that you guys have them at your meetings, um, but a lot of them, Tarflower included, um, offer plant sales regularly. So you can um, you know, get plants from them and they will know everything that's happened. They can tell you all about the plant and um, make sure that you're getting something that's gonna be good for your landscape. And as I mentioned earlier, avoid the invas the non-native and the invasive species. Um, this is really important to reiterate. If you don't know if a plant is invasive, um, check out this website, floridainvasivespecies.org. They have a comprehensive list of, of all the invasive species. They update it every two years, so it's, it's always current. Um, but you can check ahead of time and find out if, it's, if what you're interested in is on that list, and then you'll know that you want to avoid it. So those are kind of the basic fundamentals of you know, what to consider when you are converting part or all of your landscape to, um, to a native habitat. And so we um, wanna share our story because um, you know, we, we lived in a condo for 12 years and didn't have the ability to do anything, but we've been in this house for um, three years now. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, when, um, yeah, so I'll let Craig tell it because this is really, um, you were More probably wondering why I'm here. <laughs> why is Stacy's boyfriend just sitting next to her? Well, this is the part where I get to talk about how I became a plant lover. So yeah, a, a little over three years ago, we moved into a house and finally had a yard. And while I liked plants and certainly just through my experience with Stacy's love of plants, I I became more familiar with it and participating in native plant events and stuff like that. The garden, having this opportunity with the garden really has been a game changer for me. I said this at the meeting and I'm gonna say it again. Craig, Craig came on a few uh, Native Plant Society hikes and just didn't understand why we didn't move very far in the couple of hours we were out there. Um, but I think now he gets it. <laughs> oh, I, I understand. Yeah, I just have to be prepared for that. Yeah, but you do that now. Okay, oh, sorry, yes, next slide. Okay. All right. So, so here's uh, how our yard looked when we moved in. And we, we knew that this was a goal of ours. We just didn't know when we would get to it. But then when COVID came along, we both found ourselves working from home full time, staring at this, this yard of mixed varieties of stuff we didn't want. Um, we thought, why not get right to it? And so, yeah. So, and I'll just point out too, there were some Thai plants and some uh, Liriope. Liriope, thank you. But then we've also got this massive mother-in-law's tongue and there's Suriname cherry, just invasives. The whole yard was, was a variety of, of weeds, weedy ground cover, um, not just turf grass, but a whole lot of other things. So we, we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but uh, you know, I, everything Stacy just talked about in terms of creating habitat, diversity of, of options for the different wildlife that we'd love to help serve with our yard. And so neither of us, as smart as Stacy is about plants and has tons of knowledge, neither of us really have landscaping experience. And so we reached out to Green Isle Gardens and uh, Mark and April came to our house and got to just talk with us a bit about what we wanted to do. Having paths was something that was really important to us. And so they sketched up this, this concept for our yard, giving us recommendations for plants, some of which we went with, some, some things changed. And 
since we wanted to do it ourselves and didn't really know how to remove the existing grasses, I asked Mark and, and he said to me, matter of fact, um, you use a sharpened shovel. And I didn't know what that meant exactly. And he explained to me that it was a flathead shovel and you take a file to it and, and make it sharp. Maybe some of you in this are familiar with that, but I had never heard of it. And so that's what we did. We sharpened the end of a shovel and, and began to clear the property. So we, we started by scraping off all the top layer and it was much harder than I think we anticipated. Um, it's pretty backbreaking work. And so we, we realized that we needed to start small. We also didn't even realize how much waste we would have from cleaning small areas of the yard. And so we ended up needing to also get a dumpster bag that we could just fill up, which kind of blew my mind how much it was we removed. so much, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like it when you just look at the surface, but then once you've started to remove it. So, so if you don't have to do it yourself, uh, you yeah. might want to consider not scraping your own um, your own yard. Yeah. And there are different ways you can go about treating it. Um, we we kind of just went with the you know the the scraping off the top layer um, that does create or or. You do still have weed pressure coming back, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but you, you know, if you have the ambition to solarize or do other methods of treating your your landscape before you plant, um, there are other ways to go about it. But um, you know, yeah, I wouldn't do it again if if I if we had to do it over. Yeah, and and, and because it was so hard, we did it over a period of time. We just do sections, and then we go to the Green Isle. We get a bunch of plants for that section. And that allowed us to get stuff in the ground. I was very anxious to sort of see the garden. And so getting plants into the ground right away was super important. And, and it was important for us to research the proper conditions. As much as Green Isle gave us guidance, we also had to do our own research. So, yeah. We have a lot of oak litter. We have a giant oak and then a smaller um, sand live oak. And so there, there's a lot of oak leaf litter which can affect the acidity of the soil. Um, we're not entirely sure you know, what all it, it added to it, but that is something to think about. Oak leaves, pine needles, they do have tannins that can affect the, the pH level. And I just wanna back up a second. So having these paths, I'm pointing to the <laughs> design, but hmm. having the paths in the design naturally created sections. So that, that gave us kind of a guidance of like, well, we'll start with this, one piece up by the front of the house and then move around. But but having the paths kind of designated the sections for us and, and gave us guidance on how to like, just, you know, start start small because that was definitely um, helpful. Yeah, so for me, it was also about patience. Um, being home every day, working from home and seeing the garden and walking around the garden all the time. Um, I've had to practice patience because I want everything to grow big and always be flowering. And so while I can imagine what it'll be like, maybe in another five years, um, it's going to take time. And so part of me trying to manage or us trying to manage our anxiousness for the garden to look full, we buy a lot of plants. Um, for us, we had to think about where it was going. Is it, like Stacy mentioned earlier, the right plant in the right place? Um, we tried to pack in some of the stuff over time as things decided whether they wanted to survive or not, we would have to get more plants to fill in. We also played around a little bit maybe with what someone might say is the right place for it um, because we wanted to see what might happen. And we were certainly encouraged by Green Isle to just sort of see if it'll work because we'd ask them like, oh, this is the condition. Well, maybe they're not the exact right conditions, but um, we've had some success doing that. You also want to think about the plant size, like especially if you're doing trees or shrubs, you, what you're buying is not a mature plant, most likely. So, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're allotting enough space for what that plant's going to grow into. Whereas wildflowers and grasses, you can, well, grasses, some grasses, but definitely wildflowers, you can plant them a lot closer together because most of them aren't going to be um, growing out in the, you know, spreading wide, depending on the species. Um, we'll talk about some of the species we bought and, and 
And so for me, the more plants we get, the more excited I get to see how the yard is doing. Uh, obviously, the more plants you buy, the more expensive it can be. Um, for us, we give away plants a lot because we have so many that propagate in our yard. And so you can certainly look around for people who, are, who have extra uh, plants to give away. For instance, our tropical sage and our violet and our rouge plant, we have so many of them at all times. And so we're always offering them up to people. Um, you can also find out if people you know might have seeds to give away that they collect from their own native plants, which is something I've started to do recently. Um, and as you know, connecting with Native Plant Society and others uh, who are already um, experts in this area might be willing to give you plants. So here's how our yard started. And then here is how it is. I'd say this was probably in the fall. Right now it's looking a little yeah. more dormant than this photo, which makes me a little sad, but I'm trying to get over it. Um, but, but, but that's something to consider too when you're choosing plants. You know, if you know that the plant is an annual and it's going to disappear, then you might want to rethink that. Or um, if it's an annual that reseeds heavily, then that's good. Even though the plant's going to die back, it's going to, um, you know, put out a lot of progeny. Um, or, you know, again, having things that are evergreen throughout the year. Um, we have a good mix of it. Um, some of our wildflowers have kind of died back, but we've got lots of seedlings coming up. So it's, you know, even though we don't have that big bang, um, you know, of color, we still have a lot of plants that are, that are going to be popping up soon in the spring or that are already started popping up, but that are going to be um, filling in those spaces in the spring. Yeah, I'm watching the yard currently like a hawk for things popping up, but I'm not, I don't know plants well enough yet to tell if what's coming up is what I want or not. And so it's going to be a little bit longer and we just had a lot of rain recently. And so that made me excited because there's been a lot of seeds uh, that have the potential to sprout. And for me, I spend a lot of time just walking around the garden as someone who wasn't really that involved in native plants or even that knowledgeable, especially that knowledgeable. Now I find myself in the garden every day looking around, um, just trying to find cool stuff. I get excited. I have a tremendous sense of pride about what we've created. And so that gives me a lot of peace and calmness. And so I, I feel really at ease when I'm walking around the garden. And you can sort of see in the, in the photo, we have a bit of a slope, so um, it's kind of hard to see everything, but we did stagger things in layers. So right along the front, we have Elliot's love grass, which is a lower growing bunch grass. And then behind it is muley grass, which is a little bit taller and has these nice purple plumes in the fall. And then behind that, it, we have three Fakahatchee grasses, which get really big. They've big. Um, yeah, they've gotten really big, but they, but so we have that nice layering, but because it's on a slope, it doesn't necessarily block our view. We have a, a nice little, um, seating area up against the house. We want to be able to see out, but still have you know a little bit of a screen. But you can also kind of see from the picture, we've planted a few um, yop and hollies and um, a couple other, you know, some other shrubs in there that are going to get a little bit larger um, over the years. So, um, you know, again, thinking about layering and thinking about um, having different strata of plants or different habits of plants is really important visually and as a part of um, building habitat as well. So um, we'll just, I'm just going to show some of the plants that we have used. Um, the ones we've selected are really easy to establish. Um, all of the photos, most of the photos from here are from uh, Craig's Instagram account. Um, not only did he become a plant guy, but he became so much of a plant guy that he created an Instagram account for our yard. And um, you can follow it at Noble Native Garden. Um, we live on Noble Place, so that's why we, we called it that. Um, yeah, most of these photos are, are from our plants. Yeah. We just, we've been very fortunate to have some beautiful plants. Do you want to talk yeah, about plants? Yeah, yeah. On, on the left are the blue curls, which have done super well in our yard. They're in a sunnier spot than most. Um, we have three of them, and when they bloomed, they 
went bonkers. And what's cool is it's almost like they agreed on a schedule to flower <laughs> because even now that most of them have gone to seed, there's still some parts of it of, of the three that are flowering. And I, I don't know how many months now it's been flowering for. It's and this incredible. Is a, this is an annual, um, but it, it, so it will die back. Um, ours has not yet, but, um, but it does produce a ton, a ton of seeds. So again, even though it's not gonna, the plant's not gonna stay around for a long time, um, there's gonna be other seedlings coming up. And this one does have a long flowering season um, and it produces a lot of these really cool, um, intricate little, purple flowers. Yeah, and on the right is mimosa. It's an awesome ground cover. It's right near the blue curl, so it it too is in a very sunny spot. It was our last bit of turf grass. It was really at the end. We we hadn't even really considered for sure if we were going to get rid of it, and we did. And our neighbor even let us clear the little bit of grass on his side. So that mimosa in probably about five months, six months, has covered the whole area that we cleared. And, and we'll cover more, more areas, um, which is fine with me. The flowers are stunning and the bees love it. Yeah, this is good for, um, for open disturbed areas. It does really well in that kind of condition, nice sunny and not particularly nutrient rich soils. It's a member of the bean or legume family. So it does add nutrients back in. And that's good if you, if you have an area that's kind of disturbed and, and harsh, adding um, plants from the legume family can add nutrients into the soil and maybe make it um, suitable for, uh, for you to put other plants in. Um, this one likes to creep too. Uh, it does spread pretty aggressively if you let it, but if you just put up a little barrier, that does tend to kind of stop it. We have um, little fallen branches that we collect and put to line our paths, and that's done a pretty good job of keeping it from growing into the path. A little bit. It, it has you a mind also, of its own. It you does. can cut it back. You too. can cut it. You can mow it. If you're using it as a ground cover and for some reason still need to mow, um, you can mow over this and it will come back. It's also nicely. a sensitive plant. So when you touch mm -hmm. its leaves, they actually close well, up. Yeah, a little bit. This one's not as bit. sensitive as, as its cousin, but, but yeah. And it's a larval host plant too, which is good to have. Uh, on, the, on the left here, we have Blazing Star, Liatris, and uh, Gulf Fritillary. Uh, this is also in our yard. The liatris was a newer addition, uh, a, three like kinds a different, of a different phase, a, a later phase after we had finished the garden, but then decided to fill in some spots. And I always, I liked it when we would see it out in, in nature. And so we decided to get some and it did great. We put it in and it flowered very quickly, which was very satisfying for me. And we had a lot of pollinators. Yeah, we put um, we put some in that grass area that I talked about earlier, and it's a really nice complement because it's a tall, thin plant. So it's it's just a really nice complement to that evergreen grass backdrop. Um, but we we have three different species, and there are quite a few different ones available um, that range from drier to wetter loving conditions. So. Um, you know, depending on your landscape, there's probably a liatris for you or blazing star. I will mention that this is one of the ones that you can also find in big box stores. Um, generally, even the, the, the blazing stars that you get at the big box stores are not the native. So again, just be mindful of that. But this is a great attractor for butterflies, bees, moths, even yeah. hummingbirds occasionally, although we haven't seen that yet, but in yeah. nature. They yeah. love it. Um, on the right is a carpenter bee, uh, nectar robbing from a tropical sage flower. Um, part of my real joy is waiting around for the bugs and stuff just to try to catch them doing awesome things. Because I didn't know about nectar robbing until I showed Stacy a photo and, and explained to me what, what was happening there, which was pretty cool. And then this just shows you what the flowers actually look like. These are... Um, that's the blazing star. And then the tropical sage you can get, it's typically red, but there's also a white and a pink variety that um, you can get at your native nursery. So the other, the bee was on the white variety. And they spread, the tropical sage spreads like Ooh, crazy. Yeah. So, so your options are either love that you have tropical sage everywhere or tell your friends who might want some tropical sage. We give away tropical sage all the time. Tons of it, um, yeah. But that's everywhere. the beauty of it is it's easily transplantable. So 
when we find it growing where we don't want it, we just pop it out into a little pot of soil and it's it survives pretty easily. Yeah, we, yeah. we give them away. Uh, upper left is a uh, fully blooming green eyes. Um, and below that with the cool outer space fly is uh, a not yet fully bloomed green eyes. Um, this is a really cool flower because of its fragrance. Yeah, when it's fully open, it smells like chocolate. It is heavenly. It's very subtle. You kind of have to stick your nose It's not in, that subtle. Depends. We have a few, so. But this is a really easy plant for, um, for dry areas. It's very drought tolerant. Once it's established, it creates this really big, thick, tuberous root, which makes it very drought tolerant, um, but easy to establish great for bees and butterflies. It has a pretty long bloom time. Ours kind of blooms throughout the year. Yeah. Um, it's, I noticed today one is getting a bloom. Yeah, it's generally a spring and summer bloomer, but um, you know, as it gets further south and uh, as climate change happens, um, its bloom time seems to be pretty long. And it's a perennial, so it'll be around for a while too. Yeah, and on the right, the big photo is Stokes Aster with a green metallic sweat bee. These bees are super cool. I, I don't know that I had ever noticed them before until we started having flowers that I looked at every day. Yeah, this is another easy one. And it, it doesn't spread very much, um, but we have this growing in a sunny and a semi-shady area. So it, it can ha handle a variety of, of exposure conditions, um, but it doesn't spread out. It produces these nice stalks of, of um, blooms, but then it has a good bit of seed and the seed's really easy to collect. Um, and we've been sprouting it in the back, in our back area too, but it's another great one for attracting bees and butterflies, wasps. It's really just, it's, it's stunning too. It's flowers a little bit larger than mm -hmm. some of the other ones we have, so. Yeah, it's a great flower. Uh, on the left here is a firebush flower with an orchid bee wearing pollen pants. Um, very fashionable these days for pollinators. Um, I had never heard of an orchid bee, and really the first time I noticed them is they would fly around our wild sweet basil. Another native. Yep. We and do have a native basil. We, yep, it is true. And it, and smells, it smells so amazing. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And you can just brush against it and the air smells like it immediately. But these orchid bees hover. Um, and so I really enjoyed trying to get photos of them or taking slow-mo video, which I posted a bunch of uh, orchid bee slow-mo video, including one where, where it's crashing off the leaves like a drunken pilot. Follow us on Instagram. You yeah, can see yeah. all of Craig's but amazing videography. This, uh, this orchid bee, that's its tongue out, which is kind of amazing. And sometimes when I was recording this, he would come out and the nectar was literally dripping off his tongue and he would take his front legs and wipe it which didn't make sense to me because you want to eat it but and then he just go right back in and on the yeah so well and these so this is a shrub and it can actually get pretty tall i was just visiting um selby gardens their native garden that um our organization funded and they've got fire bush that are their trees it's amazing um, but they also can be kept pretty small. You can cut them back and keep them in size. But they have these nice little red tubular flowers. They're very attractive to butterflies, especially long zebra long wings. Um, hummingbirds like these too, and the long-tongued bees that can actually get down in there. Um, it produces flowers and fruit pretty much year round. So it's a great source of um, food throughout the year. And it's an evergreen, um, so, in the right conditions, it can really have nice dense foliage um, that will again provide cover for um, you know for your wildlife. Yeah, and on the right is a blue porter weed with a white peacock butterfly, absolutely beautiful. And I love this plant because its flowers are edible and they taste like vanilla mushrooms. The fruit on the firebush is also edible, but Craig doesn't think it tastes as good. It doesn't. It definitely doesn't. Um, this one, this is a nice kind of higher ground cover plant. So it, it's low growing. It only gets, you know, about a foot tall at the most, but it spreads out. Um, and so it, it's, it fills in really nicely. Um, there is an invasive species that looks very similar. The flowers almost look identical. Well, they do look identical. And the plant itself is very similar, except it grows upright. So it's very tall and um, 
erect versus low and sprawling. So you wanna make sure you're getting the, the right native species. Um, but this one's great. It's, it's ours has been blooming Constantly, year round. Yeah. Um, the, time. the flowers yeah. only open um, in the sun and they typically close up by the end of the day, but they have these long wands of tiny little flowers. And so there's just constantly stuff um, blooming and it, it is a larval host for the tropical buckeye too, which again, keeping, you know, providing larval food is good. And this is a picture of the plants. Um, a little wider. Wider shot, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, and there's there's Puerto Rita. Again. Yeah, there's Puerto Rita. It's very popular with the pollinators. It's yes. a zebra long wing, and on the right is partridge pea, which I just started um, growing from seed to because it's so prolific with seeds that I thought, oh, I may as well try to see if I can sprout it myself, and then either give those away or plant them in spots around our yard. Yeah, this is another um, member of the bean or legume family. So nitrogen fixer, plant it in disturbed soils and it'll kind of enhance it. Um, this is a larval host to a, a number of butterflies. It also has nectar glands at the base of the leaves that attract other insects like ants and flies that then will attract the birds that wanna eat them. Um, but the birds also eat the seeds as well. And it is an annual, so it does go away. But like Craig said, it produces a ton of seeds. So it's, it's um, you know, puts out a lot of, of plants and you can also collect the seeds and um, it germinates pretty easily as well. Yes, it does. All right, on the left is a friendly <laughs> ladybug. Um, and I don't remember what that was on, but uh, on the right is a beautiful echinacea flower. You yes. talk about that one at all? <laughs> um, yeah, this is another like stunning aster member, this beautiful purple with that orange center. It's just very striking. Um, this is a plant that typically, well, it's only found in the northern part of Florida. It's an endangered plant, but it's it's widely available at native nurseries. Um, pretty easy to grow. We have this one growing in semi-shade as well. Mm -hmm. So it's- Yeah, we have um, a few and they're all in kind of filtered. Yeah, yeah. Filtered. Depending on the time of day or, or what part of the year where the sun is north, yeah. south. But this one attracts a lot of pollinators, butterflies and bees. Um, the seeds are eaten by birds and other wildlife too. So, um, you know, again, this is another one too though. If you go to big box stores, mm -hmm. you will find echinacea probably not from here. At least I can guarantee it's not from here. So, you know, again, you want to make sure that you're getting from a local na native nursery. So it's grown from Florida stock. And I'm trying to propagate it, but none of them have sprouted yet. So <laughs> I'll update you at a later webinar. Um, so, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So now we have this amazing habitat. Um, it does still have a long way to go, um, you know, and we have made some I won't call them mistakes, but we've learned that some plants don't like the conditions that we put them in. And we've had to kind of grow along with that process and uh, you know, find other plants that, that might work. Um, planting around the oak trees is a little bit difficult because they are um, just challenging to, to grow things around, but we're, we're kind of playing around to see what's gonna survive. But it's just been an amazing journey for us. And I think even more so, um, for you. Yeah, no, def definitely. I mean, I think for me, I didn't expect to have a space that makes me feel so satisfied, so happy, fulfilled, um, to like create something that's living and contributing and also beautiful or intriguing. I can just sit and look at the garden. I don't have to do anything. I can put my phone down and, and it's, it's awesome. So I'm I, I love the garden. Yeah, so do I. And it's very therapeutic and we do weed. We still have some weeds yep. that come back, but we, we've we utilized the leaf litter from the oak trees as mulch. And that's helped. We I haven't think... utilized it so much as not <laughs> done anything when all the leaves dump from the two, the, well, we have a giant oak off to the right side there and the smaller oak to the left and between the two of them. Yeah. When we first put in the garden, we took leaves from our backyard, which was much easier to collect and use them as ground cover for when we did the initial plantings. 
But since then, we haven't had to do anything. In yeah, fact, we sometimes get almost too much leaf litter, and it might be preventing some of the ease of propagation of seeds. So yeah, the the wildflowers that you want to reseed, you got to let the the seeds have to have that soil contact. So there's sometimes too much mulch is problematic. Um, so we have gone through and kind of cleared out some of the Disturb leaves. Disturb it a little. But I think in the initial stages of of putting in this landscape. Um, using those leaves to, to put mulch around the newly installed plants was really helpful in keeping that weed pressure down. Um, and now, you know, with a lot of the ground covers we've chosen and the denser grasses, that helps, um, you know, keep the weeds a, away too. So we do still weed, um, it, but we- It's not bad. We enjoy really. it. Yeah. I like it. It's kind of, um, you know, you can kind of get into a Zen mode when you're Oh, and the leaf litter is really good because it brings in birds picking around for bugs and the lizards love it also because of the bugs. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of bees, ground nesting bees can, mm. can get under there. And yeah, it's really important to leave those leaves behind if you can. So, um, so if you want help getting started, um, we have a lot of resources on our website. We have a ton of handouts that you can download for free. Um, all of our publications are available on the website um, to, to download and share. Um, we also have over 300 plant profiles that, um, you know, we talk about all this information that you need to, to grow it, what conditions that the plants require and, and what to expect. Um, and I do have a book out that I wrote with Nancy Bissett, who is the um, owner of the Natives Nursery in Davenport, which is a, a local native nursery. Um, and we, we picked 100 species that are readily available at your native nurseries, easy to grow, um, easy to maintain, and give you all the information you need to select the right plants for your landscape and, and tell you what to expect. So, um, you know, if you're and, interested in that. Yeah, and as a beginner for me, like, I like the book because it's all right there, the information about the plant on the page with the photo. And so for me, I'm looking like I want cool flowers or I need a shrub. And, and so that yeah. book was really helpful because I had a sense for what my space was and it was easy to use. Thank you. Yeah, you did good. Thanks. So, you know, just to stress, like we did our whole landscape. Our yard is not huge, but we did do the entire front yard. In... This isn't our yard, by no, the way. No, that's not our yard. That's, that's Lisa Roberts' yard, though, our former executive director. But my point is that even if you can't do your whole landscape, even if you have restrictions that you have to deal with, it doesn't matter. If you can do something small, that's still going to make an impact. Even if you have, um, you know, a back patio and can put some container gardens, there's a lot of wildflowers that do excellent in containers um, and you're still providing even a small uh, bit of habitat. So whatever you can do, whatever you have, um, it's all important and, um, and I encourage you to, to do that. And if you have questions for us, we're always available to answer them. You can email me if you have plants that you're trying to identify or, or want more information, um, definitely um, send us an email or check out our website, um, follow us on social media and, um, and all that good stuff. And yeah, yeah. thank, thank you. you.